Today's episode of Wine and Dime is sponsored by Rooted Planning Group, a fee-only financial planning firm that believes life is about events, supported by your dollars and cents. And we want to help you achieve your goals. Hop on over to www.rootedpg.com to learn more about the services. Every week, it's my goal to share financial information that helps you in both your life and financial vineyard. We hope it takes you from your roots to the journey of your vines and the influences in the air that have helped craft your delicious life. Like wine, life and finances have different palates that should be celebrated and not judged. Hi, Wine and Dine listeners, Amy Irvine here, founder and CEO of Rooted Planning Group. And I get to have a joint conversation today with somebody that has been about a month and a half in the the making. So super excited. Sarah Connors is going to be joining us today and she is a placement extraordinaire. Is that a good terminology? Sure. I'll, take that. I'll take that. It depends on if I'm trying to impress or not, if I say just recruiter or if I go senior VP. So, <laughs> Well, Sarah, we're super excited to have you here. Um, you are coming on as a guest because of a recommendation that Kate Welker on our team actually had. We at Rooted Planet Group saw a huge number of changes in Uh, our client's placement of work last year under the great resignation, people were taking opportunities and new jobs. And we felt like we were constantly reviewing new company benefits for a lot of our clients. Well, then 2023 rolled around and it went from the great resignation to misplacements or, uh, you know, trying to find opportunities for some of our clients to actually be placed. And so now here we are, it's 2023 and we are looking for, uh, we were looking for somebody that we could refer clients to when they did get misplaced from their work. And Kate on our team said, I know somebody. And so then you and I started talking and we decided to do a podcast on that particular topic. So before we dig into that, um, I would be remiss and not talking to those that are listening for the wine recommendation this week. We always like to start the podcast out by asking if there's a particular wine that our guests like, or if there's one that I've been exploring. So I'll ask the question, are there any particular wines that you've been uh, enjoying over the last summer or, you know, something that you've come across? You know, I wish I had some great in-depth wine knowledge. I don't. I don't drink a ton anymore because it makes me not sleep well and, and already being busy and having young kids. I don't. But I will admit, I love the little mini bottles of champagne. It feels like a little celebration when I need it, but it's not a ton. So uh, not quite wine, but that's that's kind of my uh, guilty pleasure at the end of a long week. Well, it's sparkling wine, so it works, right? <laughs> it works, it works. <laughs> I am not a big mimosa fan, I, um, but I do like a friend of mine actually turned me on to it's an orange juice, peach schnapps and champagne mixture. And it's more like a tropical drink than it is necessarily, you know, a mimosa. So if I'm going to drink champagne, I will usually drink it in that manner. So it's it's almost like a sangria for champagne is the way that I think about it. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, I know people are probably interested in our little tips around wine, but, pro- but based on what's going on in today's world, um, I would love to dig into the conversation around recruitment. But before we do that, I, I I really want people to understand your background. Give us a little bit of how you got into recruiting, a little bit about you, your company, and you know wh- why you're so passionate about this, because that became very clear in our introduction call. No, it did. It did. I mean, you and I chatted for 25 minutes like it had been two minutes. We, we both clearly just had a, a passion for this, and I completely fell into it. Uh, you know, I graduated with my marketing degree. I thought I had all these great prospects. Um, I did not. I took six years in a job I didn't love. Before I finally got so fed up, I said, I'm supporting these sales guys. I could be doing the same work. I want to. I need to. If I ever want to afford a house and kids and these things, I just can't afford it You know, in the Boston area and what I'm making. And so I'd been pitching the sales team, the sales director. I was all ready to move into that role. And they told me, we lost headcount. It's going to be at least a year before we can move you into this position. The next day, I get a message on LinkedIn because I'd been building up my LinkedIn profile in preparation to move into sales. And it was from, at the time, Winter Wyman, their internal recruiter. 
And they said, you know, are you open to new opportunities? And I went, wow, if that's not the clouds parting, the sun shining down, I don't know what is. And so I interviewed with them for sales. And uh, the VP at the time said, no, you're meant for the candidate side. And he just knew it. He'd already been doing this, you know, 15 years, I think, at the time. And then he just saw what was a good match. And I said, OK, I trust you. So I left a job I knew very well and was an expert at and became a complete newbie. And I fell in love with it. And don't get me wrong, I had to kind of move around a couple of times to really find uh, what we call the right seat. Um, it was the right bus, but I was on the wrong seat a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And once I did, it clicked and it was just amazing and it took off. And now I've been doing this for 12 years and I, I there's nothing else I'd rather do. So what we do, we're now owned, um, we're called Planet Professional. We're a staffing firm here in the Boston area, but we are nationwide. Um, my team specifically does admin, accounting, finance, HR, and recruiting roles. We have sister divisions for tech, pharma, healthcare. And I'm only on the candidate side. So it gives me this really, full, really wonderful, unbiased viewpoint where the client side, the sales team, they go out, they get the jobs, they bring them in. And then I have the relationship with the candidates to go, you know, have this amazing intake call. Most people call it therapy. And I said, yep, that's how I like to recruit. And I should also feel like a free therapy session as we do an intake and talk about what's important to you and what you're looking for and why you're looking. And then as I get roles in that I think might be a good match, I run them by people going, Hey, I love X and Y for you, but oof, that commute feels tough. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we get to kind of match make all the way through to offer and onboarding. That could be temp or perm roles um, at all levels. So that's a little bit of uh, what we do. I mean, that, that really is taking somebody to from dream to implementation. Yeah. And that, that, I mean, what a, how rewarding that must be to be able to say to somebody, uh, you know, you, you have great skills, but you're not in love with your job. Let me help you find that dream job. And, and you and I had talked a little bit about prior to the, the podcast being recorded, we had talked a little bit about how to get there, like how to get yourself ready for that. And, and we also talked one of the things we other ta also talked about is imposter syndrome. We talked a little bit about that. And I'd love to hear when you're, when a candidate reaches, cause I think that's how a candidate reaches out to you and says, I'm interested in possibly relo either relocation or I lost my job and I need to find a job. So, you know, like that's step one, you might actually reach out to the candidate too, right? If you see somebody that, yeah. So either way that connection is made, what's the, what's that journey look like to sort of get that person to the, the level that attract that the companies would be attracted to them? Mm. I mean, it, overall for the process, it really starts for me with that intake call. It's the most important piece. Um, I, I have direct reports here and I do trainings internally. And I say, look, multitask all day. But when you're on that intake call, you do nothing else. You have their resume up, you have their notes up, and that's what you're soaked into. And I actually prefer to do them over the phone versus video because then I'm not even focused on how my, my facial expressions are. I'm really just digesting everything. And so I'll say, you know, what's making you look? And, and there's usually a, oh, well, you know, I'm just ready for something new. And I go, okay, you know, and, and kind of, well, tell me more about what you've been doing. And, and then I go, okay, so if you were going to make a move, what's your ideal next role? And they go, oh, that's a good question. You know, because we don't always ask ourselves that. We know something's amiss, but we don't quite know what we need. And then they'll go, okay, can I be honest with you? And I go, yes, throw it at me. And they go, I hate my boss. Okay, good. That's a good reason to leave because you can't change that. We can manage up, quote unquote, as much as we like, but their personality and who they are is going to be what it is. So that's something you can't change. If it's, um, you know, commute or pay or some other things, once in a while I'll tell someone, I don't think you should look. You love what you're doing. And it sounds like you could have a conversation with your boss about, you know, career mapping yourself to this next step or, or asking for that pay raise you've been looking for. But most of the time, there is a valid reason they're looking. And so I want them to have that really open, honest, raw conversation with me about what's going on, because I can't give you the best service unless I know what's important to you. And then as we look at each role, we map it, you know, match it against that of, Okay, you had talked about a new challenging industry. Holy cow, this one saves lives. Literally, it's pharmaceutical. It's going to be an amazing impact, but you're going to have some long days. How do you feel about that? Right. So we kind of talk through the pieces. If there's sometimes a person who says, I mean, normally by the time they talk to me, they, they pretty much know that they're looking because you don't talk to a recruiter and take that time unless there's something there. Um, but if they're not sure what it is, I'll have them do an exercise where I say list out all the tasks and all the work that you do. Rank each one, one to 10. Just one, I hate it. 10, I love it. And then after you've done that, just, just 
spit it out as quick as you can. And then when you look back at it, go, huh, I didn't realize how much I hate meetings. I love the work I do. I'm not loving all these meetings. And I actually don't want to be the top boss. And I've had a lot of candidates say that where, you know, I climbed the ranks because I was told I should. I don't know that I actually want this top spot. I want to be a strong number two. But someone else in the meetings and the politics, let me go do what I love. And I go, great. So sometimes that exercise of just evaluating what you've been doing and you know, is it the industry you need different? Is it the commute? Are you missing your kids' games and you feel like you're not balancing things well because your job is insane? And on top of that, you have a one-hour commute each way. So, you know, that's a lot of what... That's why I say it's, it's half therapy, half recruiting, because it really has to be. It should be. It shouldn't be black and white. It should have some depth and some levels to it to, to really get a full scope on it. So what do you do around, you know, a lot of and maybe it's men and women, I don't know, but I know a lot of the women that I've talked to have said, you know, I'm really interested in this particular job, but I don't have the qualifications for it. And when I talk, they probably have 50 or 60%, maybe even 70% of the qualifications, but not the other 30. I still encourage them to apply for the job because, you know, maybe they have the most of all of those qualifications that the firm is looking for. And why should that get in the way necessarily? No. Nah. Um, Great. What are your thoughts around that? The great point. So I still remember it. I had this um, during COVID. We did whatever we needed to place to uh, to make our company successful. Um, and there was this uh, this young woman I talked to. I'm twenty two, twenty four, pretty recently out of college, and she had this amazing plan. She was, you know, um, I hadn't even talked to her for long. I was actually talking to her about a COVID lab job just to kind of, you know, something that was hiring in the meantime, but she was going to get her, I think her bachelor's was in biology. She was going to study, you know, different aspects of like different drugs and then become a doctor. So she had this really amazing holistic approach to it. Um, and so later in our conversation, we're talking about something and wrapping for the interview and she goes, you know, why if, what do I say if they ask why I'm the best fit for this job? Like, I, I don't know all of this. I haven't done all this. And I say, there, right there, that's why you say that. The fact that you cared enough to even acknowledge that you might not be the best means you absolutely will be. You will stop yourself and ask questions when you don't know. You care. You want to do a great job. And I said, and plus, your just your plan alone, the fact that you want to do this really comprehensive buildup so that you can be the best doctor you can. Are you kidding me? And she went, oh my God, you should write grad program essays because I have not known what to write. And after our conversation, I feel inspired and I feel like I can do this. And I said, you absolutely can. You're already doing it. And, you know, conversely, you're right. There are some times where I'll talk and it, it is often more men than women. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. I've done everything. They lean back in their chair, arms folded. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Done it all. Of course. And they brush it off and I go, then I know you haven't done it all because if you did... You'd be giving me examples. So when you get to that interview, um, and hopefully, well, actually, maybe back up on your resume, because let's let's take this tangent. It's a great one. People say, oh, you know, what do I need on my resume? First, you need to think about who's receiving that. Recruiters are slammed, especially right now. Tons of recruiters have been laid off. So the few that are still working are taking on more racks, trying to review more resumes in a shorter amount of time. They're looking at your resume for five, 10 seconds. So you want them to quickly go, perfect. You've got A, B, and C that I'm looking for. Here you go on to the hiring manager. So I actually recommend education at the top if it sells for you well. If you don't have a degree, maybe it's not helping you, throw it at the bottom. But if you got a bachelor's from a prestigious university or you just got an HR certification, put that up there so they see that right away. And then let them see your title, your great tenure with an organization, and what that company does. If it's Google, we all need know Google. You don't need a descriptor. But if it was this amazing startup that grew from 50 employees to 200 and you helped with that growth, add that one liner under there. That's a huge selling point and they won't know that until interview and you won't get to interview unless they see it on your resume. So make sure it's easy to read, that they see the great tenure and then have some good bullets on there that are quick to digest, that show you know the job descriptions that they want A, B, and C. Make sure your resume shows A, B, and C as clear as day so that they can see you've done that. Then you get to the interview. So now how do I sell myself? I think we said, you know, how do we sell ourselves without sounding like a jerk? Well, show them the passion. Show them the examples. You know, when you say that guy that told me, oh, yeah, I've done it all. Oh, yeah, no problem. I brushed it off. I was like, oh, I just had this distaste in my mouth. But, you know, when other candidates tell me, oh, let me tell you about this project I worked on. They lean in. They're smiling. 
they're so proud of what they did and how hard they worked at it. It doesn't come off as being cocky. It comes off as someone who works hard and is passionate. So don't overthink that piece. If there's something you love and you worked hard at, you absolutely should be proud of that and sharing that with the world and don't move back. There's a really big difference between, oh my God, I got this promotion, you know, and and being flighty about it versus, oh, I had this really hard project, but when it was done, I felt amazing that I had pushed outside of my bounds and helped us through this merger acquisition, this implementation, you know, whatever those examples are. So sometimes that's it too of when you have a good example, it will inherently make it sound less fluffy and it'll it'll show the passion that you have behind it. Yeah, I think that's something that's, you know, that's, I think I mentioned to you, like that was one of my struggles is that certainly I have parts of my career that I'm really proud of and I'm sure everybody else does too. But I've always been concerned about sounding boastful or, you know, overconfident and arrogant. And it, it, some have called that imposter syndrome. Some call that, you know, just under promoting yourself. And, and, and I've interviewed people who have come across. I think part of my concern is that I've interviewed people that have come across way too confident. Mm-hmm. It concerns me when somebody is too confident, you know, like that, that is, that kind of puts me off a little bit. So then I've done interviews where I haven't been confident enough because I don't want to seem like this arrogant individual. And I was, was t- Kate and I were talking about something and I was saying that somebody that I look up to highly look up to was on a board with me and I was sitting next to her in the first board meeting that, that we had together. And I'm in my head, I'm like, I'm sitting next to, you know, this, <laughs> like I was so, and a little bit starstruck by her, even, you know, just the fact that she was sitting next to me and Kate was funny. Cause she's like, you know, that people think that about you. Right. And I'm like, no, people don't think that about me. And she's like, what world do you live in? (laughs) You know, she was joking. She said, Amy, people say that all the time. Like, it's Amy Irvine. I'm like, well, what, what would people say that about me? I'm like, well, why did you think that about, you know, this other person? It's interesting to me that, you know, those of us that are viewed successful by our peers don't think we're successful (laughs) sometimes or not to the level that deserves that kind of appreciation, I think. Um, So I've I've always wondered, like, how do you go into a meeting like that and not sound arrogant or boastful or like a jerk, but yet confident and, you know, share what you've achieved? I mean, I always, so whenever I train new recruiters here, um, I tell them, think about your doctor. If you went into your doctor and you're like, oh, I've, you know, I've got this rash. And they went, oh, um, okay, maybe we could do this. And maybe we could do that. You'd go, oh my God, I don't trust you. You'd be running out of the room. You are trusting this person with your health. And it's different, obviously. We're not saving lives in recruiting. But if someone's trusting you with their job search, it is pretty critical. Or in your case, wealth management These are big, important things that you want them to know that you are capable, that you hear them, that you're going to work hard. So I tell them, you know, have that voice and that calm and that confidence and listen. I think that's the critical piece. You know, when we hear someone who's too too cocky, too over the top, they're not listening much, right? Like I've rarely had someone who's an amazing listener and then they go, oh yeah, but they were a jerk. Like, (laughs) you know, so when you start out the conversation, it's funny, when I first started recruiting, they... Tangent, but they said, Oh, do this whole opener about who we are, what we do, blah, 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 blah. And I said, After a while, I said, no one hears me. They're so nervous about this that they don't even hear what I'm saying. So instead, I launch right in. Okay, I've got your resume. Tell me what's making you look. Mm-hmm. And it's just that calm, genuinely interested, you know, question. And I let them talk to me first. And I ask several questions before I'll even talk, you know, kind of respond. And then I go, you know, when I heard you talking, you lit up when you talked about X and Y. Is that something you think you want to specialize in next or have more of in your next role? And they go, yeah. And it's that sort of insightful question that shows you're an expert in what you do, but you listened first, right? So it's that calm confidence. And you can do the same thing in an interview. You know, if someone asks you why you're the best fit for this, you know, before you answer, make sure you're actually answering to what they're looking for. So, you know, if I understood correctly from the job description, it really sounded like, you know, you wanted someone who could do A, B, and C. Is that correct? And they go, oh, yes, except we just had a meeting and C is not so important, but D just popped up as a major issue for us. 
perfect. I'm glad you talked about that. I just did D at my last job. And here's how it went for us. We had some, you know, uphill battles, but mm-hmm. here's what we learned out of it. So you're speaking real time to what they want. You're hearing them first before you're answering. I mean, that's a great salesperson too. Can you imagine you go to a, a, a you know, a car dealership and they go, ah, oh, little lady, I got the perfect car, car for you. Excuse me? You don't know my name. You don't know what's important to me. You don't know what I want. Next, give me your mechanic. Let me talk to him. Like, let me talk to her. That's who I want to, you know, because they'll hear you first before they make a recommendation. So all of these things should be like that. Your doctor should ask questions before they give you a diagnosis, but they should be calm and confident when they do it. You know, a salesperson should hear you out before they make a recommendation. And in an interview, you should hear first what's important to them before you tell them why you're the best fit for the job. So to me, that those are the things that I think let you sell yourself without, you know, sounding like a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> What do you see some of the biggest, um, when you're thinking about the, the individuals that you've worked with over your career, what are you, what do you see some of the biggest coaching moments that mm-hmm. are you know put in front of you? Great point. So, uh, this was years ago. We actually, we used to do interviews in person. Shocking. Now, now it's all a phone. Uh, and I had this, um, this guy come in and same thing, kind of a new grad and he sat down in the chair and he leaned back. And, and I said, you know, you know, tell me what you've done. Yep, I've done X and Y and Z. And then I did this. And I, and I stopped him at the end. I said, are you open to feedback? He said, yeah. He said, how many times have you interviewed? He said, I don't know, 30. I, I like can't get anywhere. I'm not, you know, because he, he barely had some any experience. He was trying to break in. I said, yeah, it sounds like you've interviewed 30 times. That's not helping you. I said, you need to take less interviews and do a better job at them so that when you come in, you're leaned in, you're smiling, you're engaged. It doesn't feel like these rote answers that you've given 20 times. You don't want it to sound that rehearsed. You want to be a human. No one wants to work with a robot. You want to work with a genuine human that has inflections in their tone and gets excited at different points and asks questions and and stumbles. You can stumble in an interview, laugh it off, show them that you're going to be someone that in the office too, you're going to be human. You're going to make mistake, but you're going to own it. And then you're going to move forward even stronger. So that's one of the coaching things I hit a lot is um, when someone hurts, hits a certain stage in their job search, especially now. Uh, it's funny because they, they say unemployment's down, but it does not feel like it for everyone I'm talking to. Um, and obviously that's biased. I'm only talking to people who are, who are looking. Uh, but especially in the last year and a half, we've seen a ton of layoffs, especially HR recruiting roles in the Boston area. If you're going to do a layoff, Recruiters are the first to go because you're not hiring anyone. HR is the next to go because you have less people to support. So, you know, when I talk to people and they've been looking two months, six months, I say, I know this is incredibly hard. You've got to shake it off. You've got to come in fresh, research that company, give it your best shot, make it feel like this is your third interview, not your 30th. Mm-hmm. Not your first that where you're so messy, but but that third interview where you've really kind of hit your stride, you know what you're talking about, but it's still customized to this company. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, that's probably one of the biggest ones that we get pretty frequently. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point that I want to sort of accentuate. It's that research the company Mm -hmm. as somebody who hires people at this stage of her career and has in the past as well. When somebody sits down to do an interview with me, I expect that they've gone to my website, that they've looked at my LinkedIn profile that they've researched our team, that they look at the services that they offer. And yet I'm consistently let down (laughs) that that has not happened. And you know what? I want you to be curious about my company too. You know, when I ask the question, I typically will say to somebody, what questions did you have about our company? I'm I'm assuming that you looked at our website. And when they say, I don't know if I really had any, I'm like, all right, cut it. That's the interview is over. Do you coach uh, people when they're working with you, you know, on some of these things? Would you, you know, give them some examples of how they would want to go into the interview with the what information they would want to have in hand for those interviews? So it's not just about the recruitment process, but it's also the the coaching process that you're working with them on. Absolutely. And at some levels, it's not needed, right? You know, you get to a VP level, they know how to research a company, they know to, to come to the meeting prepared. Um, but yeah, certain people are certain levels. Absolutely. Um, I say, you know, if they say, you know, what questions should I ask? I say, here are a few great ones. One, tie a question in that shows you've done your homework. So even if they didn't ask yet, you've proven it. You Something like, 
you know, I saw on your, on your website that your company was voted one of the best places to work. Tell me about that. How was that process for you? How does that, you know, how do you enjoy that? Something like that where you're tying in, Hey, I did my homework, but you're also genuinely excited to, to learn more about that. Um, another question I like is at the end of the interview, you know, this has been amazing. I'm really excited. Can I ask, are there any hesitations you have? Because that gives you the opportunity to address them real time before you walk away. Because the whole interview could have been great. But if you just answered one question, and you didn't quite hit the mark of what they were looking for. And they leave, they go, eh, it was okay. Let me see who else we can talk to. Mm-hmm. But if, if they're actually willing to be honest with you and go, you know what? Yeah. When you talked about working with brokers and it sounded like you hadn't done that much, that is a key piece for us. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Actually, I did do that in two other jobs too. I, I didn't get to do that as much in this last one, but let me talk to you about my experience here and here. So now they go, okay, great. This is someone who's going to ask me smart questions, who had other examples. You get a chance to close on a really nice note. Does it work every time? No, no. Some, some interviewers are going to go, no, no questions. You're, you know, hesitations, we're good. And then, and then decline. But at least you're, you're giving yourself that chance to to push back and, and answer a hesitation that they might have. But absolutely research the company because it's one of the biggest things that qualified candidates get declined for. Obviously, they're not, you're not having an interview if you can't do the job. Your resume already showed that. Mm-hmm. So the interview is now a chance to show that you can do your homework. You can ask smart questions. You're already picturing yourself in the role and that you're someone they want to have on the team. You know, I'll have candidates ask a lot, you know, why did they pass? Like, what was the feedback? Sometimes I can say, really no feedback. But it always comes down to who do we click the best with? Who do we picture ourselves walking in Monday morning going, whew, let me tell you about my weekend or, you know, wanting side by side as we go into this intense implementation project. Mm -hmm. So that's what the interview is for is you better click with that person, have some laughs or share some great examples, you know, find some common ground because... They already know you can do the job. Maybe that's a little bit more of this, a little bit more examples and talking through it. Um, but but a good piece of it is also, do I like this person? Do I want to work with them 40 plus hours a week? Are companies, um, are companies looking at social media when they're looking to hire somebody? Some of them are. You better yeah. have it. I, we've, um, uh, I don't know that I'm allowed to say, but uh, I have heard, how about that? I've heard of companies uh, declining people based on their social media. So mm-hmm. just like anything else, right? College is looking at it. Make sure that it's it's clean and appropriate. Make sure, and even, even just professional side of things, make sure you have a LinkedIn with a nice picture, a nice write-up. It doesn't take that long. Mm-hmm. And it's something critical that it kind of shows, you know, a little bit of expertise in the industry. If you've got any publications, throw them on there, a good blog. Um, but absolutely, you, you know, you want to have a nice LinkedIn um, and you, you don't want anything to come flagging with your your name if they do search. They're not supposed mm-hmm. to, but, um, you know, you want to make sure that those things are all set. Now, as far as people like having a good LinkedIn profile, are there services out there that you would recommend if somebody's struggling with that? Um, that's a great question. People also ask, like, are there resume writing services? I'm like, I'm sure there's a million, but I don't know. Well, I'm going to ask, answer both at once because it's a good tangent too. I don't know that it's worth it to pay someone to write your resume. Some candidates, maybe it is. Um, but you also have to remember with the resume, it's, there's not a one size fits all. If you talk to 10 recruiters and hiring managers, they will each give you a different thing that they say is absolutely critical. So if you've already got a great resume and you've had it reviewed by a couple of peers or mentors, people you respect, that's fine. Don't think there's some magic sauce that $200 or more is going to you know, get on there that now you're going to get the job. Um, and same thing with LinkedIn profiles. I'm sure there are some companies that um, you know, walk you through that. But actually, even LinkedIn does itself. When you log into your profile, it'll say, you know, oh, you're only 20% complete. You know, add some job duties, add your education. So you can do that and you can look um, and you're welcome to look at mine. It is not perfect, but Sarah Connors on LinkedIn. Um, you know, you want to have a little heading. You want to have some some job descriptions. Uh, you want to have connections, right? It shows that you are a legitimate human being. If you can have recommendations, even better. Um, but really just trying to make sure that the bulk of those areas are filled out for them. Sarah, if, if, you know, if you could tell maybe the top one or two things to people that are looking to be placed or, or uh, placed in a different company, what would those one or two things be um, that you would recommend for them? Um, it's tough because it's, it's customized so much, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, one of the things that we talked about too was, can you know, how do you work with a recruiter or an agency recruiter? And and don't get me wrong, there there are some that aren't great, 
Um, and so trust your gut. If you feel like this is someone who doesn't actually value what's important to you, you don't have to work with them. There's no rule that says you do. But when I work with someone, that most critical piece to me is that intake call because things will morph as you go. And things will morph depending on why you're looking. So I'll talk to people sometimes. They go, Sarah, I got to get out of here. I, I just, what do you have? What do you have? No, it's fine. I'll do a longer commute. And you can hear that desperation in their voice. And I go, you have blinders on. You cannot accurately look at a job. So ideally, the best time to look is when you're slightly unhappy, but not desperate, because then you can actually look at a role and say, okay, is this actually going to be the right next step for me? So if you don't have an agency recruiter that you trust, because it's, that's kind of nice because we're kind of pulled back to a 30,000 foot view. We can look at all the opportunities and, and especially if someone's been doing it a while, there's just a lot of trends that you'll notice over time that we can, we can talk to someone about and just pose questions. I'll never tell someone, hey, that's the wrong job for you. But I'll go, hey, in the interview, I want you to ask about this. Like I, I just talked to someone out of um, really progressive, like medical device, life science companies. And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about this job with the state. And I go, huh, okay, tell me more about that. You, you know, and, and, and she talked about it and I said, okay, that might end up being a great opportunity, but we just about how you talked about how you love rolling out new programs, saving an organization money, getting progressive. Over many years of doing this, a lot of people who've worked for state and government agencies haven't always found that uh, inherent for them. So ask those questions in the interview. That's not to say they aren't. Maybe they are. They might have amazing leadership and they're really open to change and it's not hard. There's not red flags, red tape. But ask those questions for yourself because if that is important to you, you know, I want you to have that in the next role. And so I, I never once said it wasn't a good fit, but I did give her some questions to ask and some things to think about. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that in an agency recruiter, find that in a friend, a mentor, just someone who's, whose opinion you trust that's an outside perspective that can go, wait, didn't you tell me that it's all about work-life balance? I know this job is 35 hours a week, but it's actually a worse commute than you have. Like, will this fit? You, will this actually solve what you were looking to solve for? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's the advice is before you even look at a job, think about why you're looking and then mm -hmm. reflect everything back to that. Maybe even just write it down for yourself. So that way everything has a benchmark to go against. Mm -hmm. Any other tips or suggestions or ideas that you have? I know we're, you know, there's probably lots of them, but is there anything that we didn't talk about that you really want the listeners to know? And I'd also love for them to know how to contact you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess the other thing that came up because you brought up the great resignation, um, you know, what came out after COVID was people going, what am I waiting for? And, and that was really the big question for people was, I don't love what I'm doing. I want to switch. I do want a better work-life balance. I'm snipping at my kids. This isn't working. You know, so have those conversations with yourself a lot, pretty frequently, once a quarter at least. You know, am I happy? Are things good? Should I be looking? And maybe that's not just in your job, but in your life. Where do I need to find or fix that balance? Because balance is not a set it and forget it. It's something you're going to continuously have to work on um, and know that that's normal. I mean, that's the other piece of advice too. If you have been looking and you're struggling and you're feeling like, am I even good at this? Like, am I not valuable anymore? Why am I not getting calls? For certain jobs right now, it's a terrible market. The worst I've seen in 12 years. It is not you. It is the market. And you'd be surprised how many people I've said that to who go, oh, and you can see their shoulders drop and go, I thought I wasn't good anymore. And I said, no, how many applicants were on that job you applied for? 300? How are you going to stand out? You might be the best candidate. It's impossible for them to find you. So just that, just just breathe. Just know it's not you. Keep trying everything. Mm -hmm. I recommend when people are looking. Um, if you can and you're not confidentially looking, you can post your resume to Indeed. You can post open to jobs on LinkedIn. If you are confidentially looking, you can still apply to jobs. And, it, and there's a little bit of risk that someone might find out, especially if you're in a small world where everyone knows everyone. Um, but apply to LinkedIn, Indeed, network. Use an agency if you trust someone. Um, and absolutely, if anyone wants to get in contact, I'm like I said, I'm on LinkedIn, Sarah Connors. Um, and then you can also email me, sconnors at planet-pro.com. That's S-C-O-N-N-O-R-S at planet-pro.com. Great. And they can, the web, your 
uh, recruiting company also has a website, correct? Yep. Uh, yeah, Planet Professional. And we're owned by the Planet Group. So uh, we have sister divisions, Planet Pharma, Planet Forward, Planet Healthcare. Um, but Planet Professional specifically focuses in admin, accounting, finance, HR, and recruiting. Well, Sarah, I want to say thank you so much for taking 35 minutes, actually, out of your day today and, and taking the time to give us so much information. I know it was a lot, a lot of information in a short period of time, but the beauty of a podcast is the fact that... People can re-listen to parts of it and definitely go out, explore their website, go out to Sarah's LinkedIn profile, take a look around. If you have any questions, I mean, Sarah has been so grateful with her time uh, with me and and preparing for this podcast and even in this podcast. So Sarah, I want to say thank you so much. And I know we've referred a couple of clients to you and they have just raved about the interaction. So we also say thank you for helping our clients live a better life that they want to live. So thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much. I love it. Thanks. And we'd love for you to hop on over to uh, rate this podcast if you get a few moments. And if you have any questions, feel free to send either to Sarah or to us, and we'll be happy to explore those. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we hope to hear more from you. And that will about do it for today's episode of Wine and Dine. You can contact Amy through the website, www.rootedpg.com, or Amy at rootedpg.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at RootedPG for the latest news. And if you have any questions, comments, or topics you would like to hear about, feel free to let us know. And don't forget to rate and subscribe the show wherever you get your podcasts. And again, thank you for listening and be sure to tune in next time.